Hi. Today, we're going to learn how to predict tomorrow's weather using historical data. Like if it's raining today, maybe that means it'll be cooler than usual tomorrow. We'll be using machine learning and Python to make our predictions. First, we'll download our weather data set. And the great thing about this project is you can actually download a weather data set from close to where you live and use that to make predictions. Second, we'll read in and clean the data. Third, we'll train a machine learning model to make historical and future predictions for our data. We'll download our data from NOAA, a US government agency that actually forecasts the weather in a lot of places around the world. So they have great weather data. First, we're gonna to go to this page. Then we're gonna select daily summaries. Then we're gonna select the date range of the data that we want. So we're going to pick 1970, January 1st, to the current date. We'll search for stations. And what you can do is enter in the closest airport to you. So this actually has data for a lot of international airports too. So feel free to try the one near you. I'm gonna try JFK airport, which is one of the main airports in New York City. Then you should come to this map view, and on the left, you'll wanna just select the airport closest to you. I'm gonna select JFK and click Add to Cart. Then all the way over here at the right, you can actually go into your cart and view all items. And this is where you're actually gonna download the data. So I'm gonna select that I want a daily CSV. I'm gonna make sure my range looks good, and I'll hit Continue. Then when we come here, you wanna just hit select all to pick all of the different types of data to make sure you get everything and then hit continue again. And then you'll be ready to check out. So you just wanna enter your email address and hit submit order and you'll get an email with a link to download the data. If you don't wanna download the data from NOAA, I actually included a link to download the data in the description of this video. So you can also use that as well. Then we'll jump over to Jupyter Notebook. I'm actually using Jupyter Lab, which is an IDE. You can also use Google Colab or any other way to run Jupyter Notebooks. And the first thing we'll do is we'll just open up our data and explore it. So our data is gonna be called weather.csv. So this data, each row is a single day and the columns are different weather measurements from that day. So PRCP is precipitation, so how much rain fell that day. Snow is how much snow fell that day. SNWD is snow depth, so how much snow was on the ground. And then we have the maximum temperature during the day and the minimum temperature. It's in Fahrenheit for me. I live in the US. It may be in Celsius for you, depending on where you live and how it was measured. And these are in inches. There are a lot of other columns that I won't go into right now, but there is a data dictionary you can look at. You can also, as we go through this tutorial, also see some of those columns. All right, then we'll go back to our launcher and we'll wanna create a new notebook. And you can name this notebook whatever you want. I'm gonna name mine predict because we're gonna be making predictions. And then we'll be ready to actually get started coding. Inside this notebook, I'm gonna import pandas, which is a really popular data analysis library for Python. And then I'm going to use pandas to read in my weather data. I'll actually copy paste here. All right. So what, what's this doing? So we're using the pandas read CSV function, which reads in a CSV file into a pandas data frame. We're passing in the name of the file, which is weather.csv. That's what I've named it. And then we've specified that the first column, which is the date column, is going to be used as our index. So let me run this and then I'll show you what the index is. So let's take a look at our data frame. So we can see this weather data frame. It looks the same as our CSV file. We've just read it into pandas. And we can see on the left, our index column. And this is the column that basically gives each row a unique identifier. So each row is, is gonna be referred to by date. And then we can see the column headings here. Right. 
Now, you might see a lot of NAN values. Machine learning models do not like missing values. Most machine learning models will not work with missing values. So the first thing we need to do is just clean this data up to get rid of our columns that have missing values. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate a null percentage. So this is going to basically apply a function to our weather data frame. The function is going to be pd.isNull. So let me actually show you what this is going to do. So this, this piece of that statement is going to find the number of null values in each column. So this tells us in each column how many of the values in the column are actually missing. Then we're going to divide it by the total number of rows to get the percentage of null values. So let's go ahead and run this. And then null PCT is going to give us the percentage of null values in each column. So we can see some of these columns like ACMH and ACSH, about 50% of the values in that column are missing. And for some other columns, there's no missing values, which is great. That, that's what we want. We want columns where none of the values are missing. And missing data could mean a bunch of different things. It could mean that someone that day forgot to write the measurement down. It could be that a sensor was malfunctioning. Different sensors are installed at weather stations at different times. So sometimes a missing value just means the weather sensor wasn't installed yet. Some of these sensors were installed in the 80s and 90s for some of these values. All right, so we're then gonna clean up our data and we're going to remove any columns where the null percentage is too low. So we're gonna create a new variable called valid columns. And then we're going to take our weather.columns and then this is basically all of the columns in our weather data frame, all the column names. And then we're going to index it to say, remove any of the columns where null percentage is too high. So we're only keeping the columns where the percentage of null values is less than 5%, which is what this 0.05 is. So we can run this and then we can take a look at our valid columns and we can see that these are the columns that have less than 5% missing values. So these are the columns that we're going to keep. All right. The next thing we need to do is change our weather data set so that it only contains these valid columns. So what we're going to say is we're going to index our weather data frame and we're going to index it with our valid columns list. So this is basically only going to preserve these columns in our data. And then we're going to say dot copy. So when you assign a data frame, a slice of a data frame back to itself, usually want to use dot copy otherwise you'll get a setting with copy warning later which can be an annoying warning to figure out so just kind of an intermediate pandas tip there all right then i hate typing uppercase column names it's one of one of my pet peeves <laughs> like holding caps lock to type out column names so what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually lowercase all of the column names so to do that we're going to take our our columns and then we're going to say .str.lower. And str will basically access each string in a pandas series. And then we will call the lower method to lowercase them all. So now when we look at our weather data frame, all of our column names are lowercased. The date column, this is, this is particular to the index, and we don't actually use it for anything. So this was not lowercased, but that's not actually part of the columns, confusingly, but true. All right. Now you may remember that snow depth, which is one of the columns we've kept, has a few missing values. And I mentioned that you can actually forward fill snow depth pretty effectively. So using the last value of snow depth to fill in the next value that's missing. So what we're actually going to do here is use the pandas f fill method, which will basically look for a missing value then look for the last non-missing value in that column and fill, fill that missing value in, which makes sense for snow depth, right? If snow depth was zero yesterday, it is most likely also zero today. Now we can, we can take a look at how many missing values there are in each column by just copy and pasting this code from earlier. So let's go ahead and look at that. And we can see none of our columns have missing values now, which is perfect. That's what we need for machine learning. All right, now the next thing you usually want to do 
to get your data ready for machine learning is make sure your columns are the correct data types. So pandas columns can be of different data types. So an object data type usually indicates that that column is a string. And in this case, station is just the, if we go up, it is the ID of the weather station, and that's a string. Name is also a string. That's the name of the weather station. So these two columns are, are stored as objects, but that's actually correct. Sometimes columns are incorrectly stored as objects and we have to convert them to a numeric type. In this case, we don't. And we can see that these other columns are also stored as the correct type. So we're, we're looking good here. We also want to check our index, which are those row labels, to make sure it's the correct type. So we can see that our index is stored as an object, but it's actually a date. And if we convert it to a date, it makes some of the processing we're going to do later easier. So we're actually going to convert our index to a date time. So we'll take weather.index, and then we're going to use the pandas to date time function to actually convert our index into a date time. So we, we call this function, we pass in our index, and it's going to convert it from an object into a date time. So we can take a look at the index again, and we can see it's now stored as a date time. It doesn't look any different, but how pandas is handling it internally is different. And that means that we can actually do some additional things to it that are, that are useful. For example, if we want to just get the year component of our date, we can do this. And this will give us the years, right? See, it took out the month and the day. And that's something you can't easily do with a string. All right, now one last just check of our data before we continue and actually jump into machine learning. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we don't have any gaps in our data. So to do this, we're gonna count up how many rows we have for each year. And then we're gonna sort that by our, our year. So value counts will count up how many times each unique value occurs here. So how many times do we have the year 1970? How many times do we have the year 1971? And then sort index will sort them in order. So we can see our years in order, and we can see how many records we have for each year. So for leap years, we have 366 records. For other years, we have 365. And it doesn't look like we have any gaps or other issues. If you used your local weather data, you may actually have some gaps. And in which case, it's usually OK if you have some gaps, but just something to keep in mind. If you have too many gaps, you may not be able to make any predictions. All right. And just to, just to take another look at gaps and make sure there's nothing weird going on, we can actually plot some of our columns. So this is the snow depth column. So that's how much snow has accumulated on the ground for that day. And then we can use the plot method to actually create a bar plot showing snow depth by day. So let's run that. And pandas is a pretty amazing library, right? That small command graphs snow accumulation over time. So we can see a couple of years, there was more than 25 inches of snow on the ground. The left axis is in inches. But most of the time, New York doesn't actually get that snowy. I lived in Boston, and I think we've gotten over, over eight or nine feet of snow on the ground at a time. Boston can get pretty crazy. All right, so not too bad. All right, now we're ready for the machine learning part. And when we use a machine learning algorithm, we need to tell the algorithm what we're trying to predict. And in our case, what we're trying to predict is tomorrow's temperature. So let's take a look at our weather data frame real fast. There's a couple of columns here that indicate temperature. So T max is in Fahrenheit, the maximum temperature on that given day. T min is the minimum temperature on that given day. So what we're going to try to predict is tomorrow's T max. So if I, if I have information for today, can I predict what's going to happen tomorrow? So to do this, we're going to create a target column in our weather data frame. And to generate it, we're going to use the shift method on our data frame. So what the shift method does is it keeps the same index, but it pulls the values from the next row back. And then we're just going to take the T max column. 
So let's run this and then take a look at weather. And we can see we now have a target column and it is tomorrow's Tmax. So for January 1st, 1970, the target is 31 and that is tomorrow's maximum temperature, January 2nd, which is 31. So you can see this helps us use all of this data to predict tomorrow's temperature, which is the target. All right. Now you may notice a little issue with the last value here. It's missing. So why is that missing? Because we don't have data for October 22nd. I downloaded this data set a couple of days ago. So we don't have data for October 22nd. So it's actually missing, right? We don't have a value to pull back to know tomorrow's temperature. So if we made a prediction for this row, we would actually be predicting data that we don't have. We'd be predicting the future. So typically you want to handle this in a different way, but just to make things easier and to make it easy to get future predictions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use F fill again. So I'm just going to pull the temperature, the target from the last row forward by using F fill. So if we take a look at our weather again, we can see that we filled in yesterday's value to be the target here. It's going to cause a very, very tiny issue. That's not going to make a difference to us, right? This row has a target that that's actually not correct, but because we have 20,000 rows of data, this one row having a, an incorrect target is not going to make a huge difference and it'll make it a little bit easier for us to make future predictions. So that's why I'm using F fill there. Even though it's not technically correct, it's not really going to cause a problem. Okay. Now we're ready to apply our machine learning algorithm. Next up, we're going to apply a ridge regression model. And someone brought up a good point about checking for collinearity. And if you want to do that, what you can do is you can type in weather.core, and this will actually find the correlations between the various columns. So for example, we can see that precipitation is pretty uncorrelated from most of the columns. It's slightly correlated to snow. Tmax and Tmin are pretty correlated, which makes sense. And the target is pretty correlated with Tmax and Tmin, which also makes sense. Tomorrow's temperature is pretty correlated to today's temperature. So if you wanted to check for collinearity, that's what you could do. But let's jump back to the main focus here, which is let's apply our machine learning model. So we're going to apply a ridge regression model, which works very similarly to linear regression, except it penalizes coefficients to account for multi-collinearity. So the reason I didn't account for collinearity is ridge regression to some extent already helps adjust for collinearity. So if you're using a regular linear regression, you'd have to worry about it a little bit more. So I'm importing that from scikit-learn. Then I'm going to go ahead and initialize my ridge regression model. And there's a parameter called lambda in ridge regression. We can't use the parameter lambda in Python because it's already a reserved keyword that's used for anonymous functions. So it's been renamed to alpha. And the alpha parameter controls how much the coefficients are shrunk to account for collinearity. So you can experiment with setting this to different values. 0.1 is a good default value. So we initialize our ridge regression model, and now we need to apply the ridge regression model. So to do that, we need to do two things. First thing we need to do is create a list of predictor columns. So these are the columns that we're going to use to predict our target. And to get that, we're going to, again, index our list of columns. And this time, what we're going to say is we want all of the columns except a few of them. So we're going to say, except the columns that are in this list. And this list will be target, name, and station. All right, so what's this doing? So it's saying, give me all of the columns in the weather data frame except these columns. So we're checking to see if the column is in this list, and this is the negation operator. So it's looking for all columns that are not in that list. So we can take a look at predictors, and we can see this is our list of predictors. So pretty short, pretty sweet list of predictors. All right, now we have time series data, right? So 
our data from January 1st is linked to our data from January 2nd, right? Because today's temperature is very closely linked to yesterday's temperature, very closely linked to the temperature the day before. It's very rare that temperature will go from 80 degrees Fahrenheit one day to 20 degrees Fahrenheit the next day. So this is time series data. It's an order of date. So typically when you try to estimate the error of a machine learning model, you can use cross validation, except with time series data. With time series data, we need to be really careful not to use future data to predict the past. So we need to actually use a special technique called backtesting, at least it's called backtesting in finance, or time series cross validation to account for the time series nature of the data. So we're going to write a function called backtest. And this function is going to take in our weather data frame, our ridge regression model, our list of predictors. It's also going to define a start parameter. So this is how much data we want to take 10 years of data before we start making predictions. And then we're going to define a step. So this means that every 90 days, we'll create a set of predictions and then move on to the next 90 days and then the next 90 days. So this is going to generate predictions for our entire set of data, except the first 10 years. So we're going to have predictions from 1980 all the way through 2022. And the predictions will be will respect the order of the data. All right. So first thing, we're going to create a list called all predictions. And each element in this list is going to be a data frame that has predictions for 90 days. Then we're going to write a for loop. So we're going to say for i in and then range. And we're going to start with our start parameter, which is 3650. We're going to go up to weather.shape0, which is the end of our data set. And then we are going to advance 90 each time. Then we're at each iteration, we're going to create a training set. So the training set is the data we use to train our machine learning model. And this is going to be all of the rows in our data up to row I. And then we're going to create a test set, which is going to be I up to I plus step. So this is going to take all of the data that comes before the current row to use as our training data. And then this is going to take the next 90 days to make predictions on. Then we're going to go ahead and fit our model. Scikit-learn makes this really easy. We just call model.fit. And then we pass in our predictors. So our predictors are what we're using to actually make our judgments. And then we're going to pass in our target. And our target is what we're trying to predict. So we're, we're telling scikit-learn to fit our ridge regression model to the data. Then we're going to tell scikit-learn to generate our predictions. So we're going to assign this to a variable called preds. And we're going to use the model.predict method. And we're going to pass in the predictors from our test data. So this is going to generate our predictions. And then we're just going to make our predictions a little bit nicer to work with. So this code we already wrote has actually done all of the work of fitting the model, creating predictions. We're just going to make our predictions a little bit nicer to work with, because by default, this returns a NumPy array. I think this is actually changing in the newest version of scikit-learn, but we have to probably wait a little bit for that. So we're going to take our predictions, and we're going to convert them into a pandas series which is just easier to work with than a NumPy array. And we're going to specify that our index is going to be the same as our test data. All right, then we're actually going to concatenate our real test data in with our predictions. So we're going to use the pandas concatenate method, which can combine multiple series or multiple data frames into one. So we're going to pass in our test target, which is our actual values. So these are the correct target values, which is tomorrow's temperature. And then we're going to pass in our predictions. And this is going to turn it into a single data frame. And then we're going to say axis equals 1, which means treat each of these as a separate column in a single data frame. All right, then we're going to name our columns. 
because what use your columns unless you know what they are, right? You got to name them. So our first, our first column is going to be called actual. That's the actual value of our target. And then the second column is going to be our prediction. And then we're going to create a little column called div, which is going to be our prediction minus our actual just the difference. And then we're going to take the absolute value of that. So it's going to give us our difference. And if our difference is negative, it'll just turn it into a positive number. So this is just basically the difference between what we predicted and what actually happened. All right. And then at the end of this, we can, to our all predictions list, we're going to append combined. And then we're going to return a concatenation of all predictions. All right, so each time we go through this loop, we'll generate predictions for 90 days. We'll add those predictions to this list. And then at the very end, we'll turn all of those predictions into one very, very long data frame. Before, when we called pandas.concatenate, we passed axis equals one, which means treat everything passed in as a separate column. By default, I didn't include it because it's a default, axis equals zero. So that means treat everything like separate rows. So it'll make it into one long data frame. All right, that's our backtest function. Now the fun part, we can actually make predictions by calling our function. So we're gonna create a variable called predictions and we're gonna generate predictions by calling our backtest function and passing in our weather data frame, our ridge regression model and our predictors. And that'll just take a couple of seconds. Ridge regression models run very, very quickly. And then we can take a look at our predictions and we can see, so we skipped the first 10 years because we used 10 years of data to make our first set of predictions, but we have predictions from the end of 1979 onwards through to 2022. Now we can eyeball this and try to figure out how good our predictions were but that's a pretty poor way to, to do it. A better way to do it is to generate an accuracy metric. So the metric we're gonna use is mean absolute error. It's very, very simple. Um, it's basically just taking this diff column and finding the average. Instead of coding it ourselves, we're going to import it from scikit-learn. And then we're going to go ahead and call this function. And then we're going to pass in our actual values. So that's our, our actual column. And then we're going to pass in our prediction column as well. All right. And this will spit out a number that indicates how effective our, our algorithm was. And I will explain what that means in just a second. But I'm pretty sure you can also just do this and get mean absolute error as well. This should be the same number. Yeah. So it, all it is is taking all of our differences and finding the average. Scikit-learn implements a bunch of different error metrics. So you can, you can play around with different ones, but it's always nice to understand how they work. So I showed you both. Now, what does this mean? So it means on average, we were five degrees off from the correct temperature. On average, it means about half the time we were further off, half the time we were we were closer. So not great accuracy. I mean, five degrees Fahrenheit isn't a huge error, but we can do better. And the next thing I'll show you is how to actually improve and make the accuracy better. I don't think I'll have time to get through all of it. All right. Uh, you may notice in the code that I'm just going to skip a couple of things. That's because I want to get to the main part, which is generating the predictors that will improve our accuracy. All right. So we're going to write a couple of functions that will help us improve our accuracy. The way we're going to improve our accuracy is by calculating the average temperature and precipitation in the past few days. So the past three days and the past 14 days and looking at how the current day compares to those days. And the reason why this will help accuracy is some days, just for random reasons, you may have noticed some days you go outside in the middle of the summer and it's really cold. Some days you go outside in the winter and it's really hot. 
looking at the average from the past few days instead of just today's temperature can help if today's temperature was just really weird for some reason. All right, so we're first going to define a quick function to calculate percentage difference. So you may remember this from math class. It's just the percentage difference between two values. The new value minus the old value divided by the old value gives you the percentage dip change. All right, now we're going to write a function called compute rolling. And this is going to help us find, as I mentioned, those rolling averages for the past few periods. So we're going to take in the weather data frame, the horizon, which is the number of days we want to compute the rolling average for, and the column name we want to compute the rolling average on. All right, then we'll create a label. So this label is just going to be a string that is the name of the new column we're going to create in our data frame. So for example, if we were finding the rolling average of the max temperature for the last 14 days, this would turn into rolling underscore 14 underscore T max. So this is called a format string. It was introduced, I think in Python 3.9 or 3.10. It's awesome. It makes it really, really easy to create dynamic strings. All right, then we're going to take this label and make it into a new column. And this column is going to be weather call. So if call is Tmax, then this will take the Tmax column and it will compute the rolling mean over the horizon. All right, so if horizon is 14, this is gonna compute the 14 day rolling mean. So what does a rolling mean do? So if we go back up to our weather data, it will take the last few rows before a current row and compute the average of a column across all of those rows. So if we started on January 5th and we wanted the five day rolling mean for T max, we would look at all five of these days and we would find the average maximum temperature. So that's what we're doing here. And then we'll also find the percentage difference between the current day and the rolling. So this is going to be label underscore percentage. And then this is where we're going to use our percentage difference function. We're going to pass in the, the average value, which is the base value over the past few days. And then we're going to find the column value. And then we're going to go ahead and return weather. And then we can run this for a couple of different horizons. So we're going to run this for three day horizon and a 14 day horizon. And then we're going to write a little loop. So for horizon in rolling horizons. So this will iterate through three days and 14 days. And then we're going to iterate through a few columns, T max, T min and precipitation, which is the amount of rainfall we got. So we're going to compute these rolling columns, weather horizon and columns. All right, so this will add a bunch of new columns to our weather data frame, which we can take a look at. We now have all of these rolling columns over here. And you can see there's a few missing values. So the reason for this is if we're finding a 14 day rolling average, for these dates, we don't have 14 days of historical data to compute a rolling average, right? Our data started on January 1st, 1970. So there aren't 14 days previous to that that we have data for. So pandas has, has basically labeled all these rows missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove the first 14 rows. So I'm going to say weather equals weather dot ILOC 14 onwards. So ILOC will index a data frame by number instead of by index. If you do dot LOC, then it'll index by, by date. ILOC indexes by number. This will basically cut out the first 14 rows because those are the rows that have missing values. All right, then we can take a look at our weather data frame. All right, perfect. Except there are still a couple of missing values here and that is in the percentage column. So this happens when we're basically dividing by either dividing by zero or dividing zero. So we have, to, we have to solve this as well. And the way we'll solve that is we'll just say weather 
equals weather dot fill na zero. This means find any missing values and fill them in with zero. All right, and now what we can do is we can add a couple more predictors. So we'll first write a little function called expand mean, and this is going to take our data frame as input. And what it's going to return is basically, it's going to look at each row in the data frame, then take all the previous rows and that row, and then return the mean of all of those rows together. And in just a second, we'll see why we actually need this function. So we're going to write a for loop that loops through each column in this list of columns, temperature max, temperature min, and precipitation. And we're going to use that to create two new columns for each of these columns. So we're first going to create a month average. So the average for a given month for that column. So for example, we'll find the average monthly temperature in all Januarys that we have data for. So January 1970, 1971, et cetera. We'll take the average of, of all January temperatures and put them together. So to do that, we'll first grab the column that we're looking at. So that could be Tmax, Tmin, or PRCP. Then we'll use the pandas group by method. And what this does is it groups a single column by another column. So in this case, we're going to group it by the month of our index. So it's basically going to group all of the temperatures or precipitation values from January together, all of the ones from February together, et cetera. We're going to pass in group keys equals false. This just tells pandas to make the output clean and not include another level to the index. And then we're going to apply this function expand mean. All right. So this is a little bit complicated, but what it does is it's, it's going to go through our data, group it by month. So all of the Januarys will be together. All of the Februarys will be together, et cetera. Then it's going to go one by one through each group and find the mean of all of the dates before that given date. So if we're looking at, let's say, January 1st, 1970, it's going to take all of the temperatures that we have from, sorry, January 1st, 1971. It's going to take all of the January temperatures from 1970 and that one day from 1971 and average them together. If we're looking at January 1st, 1974, it's going to take all of the temperatures, all of the January temperatures from 1973, 1972, 1971, and 1970, and then combine them with that one row to find the average temperature. This way, we're finding the average temperature in a given month, but only on days that we already had information for. So it's not realistic to take the average of all of the January temperatures when we're actually looking at a row in 1980, because we wouldn't at that point have known what happened in 1990 or 2000 or 2020, and that can make the data biased. So instead, what we're going to do is we're only going to look at temperatures that we already knew on that date and take the average of those temperatures. So a little bit complicated, but hopefully that explanation makes sense. And then this will create one new column for each of our existing columns. Then we're going to create another similar column, but this one is going to be the average on that day of the year. So it'll be called day average. And then what we're going to say is we're going to look at, again, a group by. So we're going to take our column and use the pandas group by method, except this time we're going to group by day of year. So this will be one on the first day of the year, two on the second day of the year, and so on. And then we'll say again, group keys equals false. And then we're going to apply the same expand mean function. So this will create six new columns in our data, two new columns for each of these original columns. All right, let's go ahead and run that. And then let's go ahead and take a look at our data frame. And we can see all the way on the right, we have these new columns here that give us the rolling monthly and day averages. All right. Now we have our new set of predictors. And now what we can do is go ahead and rerun our model. 
So we're going to go ahead and just copy and paste our code from earlier that created our list of predictors. We've added a lot more columns to our data frame, and we want those to be picked up by our list of predictors. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we can see these are our new predictors that we're going to use. And the amazing thing about functions is we already wrote our backtest function. We don't have to write it again. We can actually just call it again and just pass in our new weather data frame and our new predictors, and it'll give us updated predictions. And then we can again just do mean absolute error to find our error. So it is a good bit lower now, which is great. And we can take a look just at our predictions data frame, and we can do sort values, which will sort our data frame by a single column. In this case, we're going to sort it by the difference between what we predicted and the actual temperature. And we're going to say ascending equals false, which means sort them in descending order. So we can see the days on which we had our biggest errors. These are typically days where the temperature the day before was a lot lower and the temperature the day after was a lot lower. So they, they're kind of anomalous days. And we can investigate that by using weather.loc. So indexing by the index. And for example, if we wanted to take a look at what happened on March 12th, 1990, we could say we want to take a look at all of the rows from March 7th to March 17th, 1990. And what this gives us is our rows immediately before and immediately after the anomalous temperature. So we can take a look here and we can see 85 was, was really seemed kind of random, right? There are a lot of lower temperatures than 85, then a lot of lower temperatures again. So with the data we have, this type of thing would actually be really hard to predict. We would need more detailed atmospheric data about wind conditions or barometric pressure, cloud cover, things like that, to really predict these kinds of weird, weird days. All right, there's one other diagnostic we can look at. So what we can do is we can make a little plot that indicates how often we fall into each error bucket. So we can take our diff column and then we'll go ahead and round it. So a diff of zero of 0 0.1 would be rounded down to zero and so on. So we just get the nearest whole number. And then we can run value counts. And what this does is it'll show us by just the nearest whole number, how many times our error was equal to a certain amount. And then we'll go ahead and sort that just so you can sort it by the actual error amount. So we can see most of the time our error was pretty low, but there's kind of a long tail of error where some of the errors are actually very, very high. And these are the things that make our mean absolute error a lot higher. You can also plot this if you want. So you can actually just call the dot plot method in pandas, and this will go ahead and create a plot for you that shows where kind of the different errors happened. Okay, so we've built our model, we've improved our model, and now we've taken a look at a few diagnostics to investigate what's happening with our model. If you wanted to continue improving the model, there's a few things you can do. So you can Number one, the, mo the best thing you can do to improve accuracy is always to add in more predictor columns. So you can try to add in more columns like this that indicate the average monthly temperature, the average daily temperature, or ratios between the two, So, or between the current temperature or current precipitation. So today's precipitation is that weird given what the, the month average usually is, et cetera. You could also take a look at these types of rolling averages and, and see if you can compute either different horizons or different types of rolling predictors. You can also look all the way back to when we did our original data cleaning. Well, you'll remember some of these columns had a lot of null values. We may actually be able to use some of these columns with null values if we process them a little bit differently. So you might want to investigate them and see if there's anything useful there. The other thing you can do to improve accuracy is actually to change out our model. So we used ridge regression in our model, but you could use XGBoost or random forest or a more complicated model that may perform better. 
more complicated doesn't always mean that it will perform better, but it could. So it's worth trying that to improve accuracy. All right, I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough, and this should give you a good overview of how to build a end-to-end -end beginner machine learning project.